Welcome to another episode of the Drew Pearson Show. I'm Mark Colombo filling in for Drew, who is in Beaumont for United Way Exxon Mobil to honor their employees who raise over a million dollars each year for the United Way. We're coming to you live from Henry's Tavern in Plano. Shops of Legacy, right off Legacy Drive and the Tollway. This place is incredible. Over 100 beers on tap, great food, great drinks, pool tables, TVs everywhere for the sports fans. So come on down to Henry's Tavern in Plano. We got a great show for you tonight. We're going to talk about that big Dallas Cowboys win 31 to 7 at home at AT&T Stadium. Incredible dominating performance by the Dallas Cowboys. We'll be joined by Miss Kelly Webster from ESPN Radio, Jim Proctor from Dodge City of McKinney, and we have a special guest, Mr. Fort and Long himself. He's my counterpart on 1053 the Fan. He's on the post game show. This guy's great, ex-Dallas Cowboys football player, Jesse Hawley. We'll be breaking down that Cowboys win. From there, we'll go to the kitchen where Paul Salfin and Jen Reed are cooking up a Philly cheesesteak with waffle fries. Yes, it is as good as it sounds. From there, we'll go to the entertainment portion of the Drew Pearson Show, where Paul Salfin sits down with the wonderful actor. He's talented, he's a producer, he's a writer. It's Joseph Gordon Levitt and his new movie, Don John. I don't know how he does it. Paul had Metallica on the show last week. Now he's got Joseph Gordon Levitt, and you can see it right here on the Drew Pearson Show. Later on the show, we'll get to the social media segment with Michael Nass, our social media director, and he'll be taking your questions via Facebook and Twitter, and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can later in the show. So we'd like to thank our sponsors, Dodge City of McKinney, Best Buy, Albertsons, the official supermarket of the Dallas Cowboys, and Lombardo's Custom Clothing and Apparel. Last but not least, Henry's Tavern for having us out Every Monday night, the Drew Pearson Show live from Henry's Tavern and home of the original 88 Burger. We have a great show tonight from Sports to Entertainment. The Mark Colombo Show starts right now. All right, we're talking Cowboys football, my favorite part of the Drew Pearson show. An impressive 31 to 7 victory. Unbelievable. Miss Kelly, what did you think about the game? I don't have anything negative to say. I know Dwayne Harris muffed a punt. Forgiven. I love you. You're fine. It was a great win. I just it was nice to see a blowout for a change. It was nice to see both the offense and the defense dominate. And of course, after a week of nonstop talking about the run game. That's right, the run game. 34 rushes. DeMarco Murray with 175 yards and a touchdown. It was, it was a pleasure to see a balanced offense, and it was a pleasure to see it all work. I love offensive line play, and the offensive <laughs> line killed it. Unbelievable. All right, Jesse Hawley, our guest superstar on the show. <laughs> What'd you think about the Cowboys, Pat? We know about the rushing attack. They unbelievable. I mean, the offensive line played great. The, the DeMarco Murray was literally it was unstoppable. But what about Tony Romo in the passing game? One of the things that you alluded to uh, on the game, the post game show, you talked about uh, the offensive line, their pride being challenged. And when you have when you have your pride challenged in this game of football, it's put up or shut up. And one of the things that we didn't see a lot of, well, didn't take a lot of notice to, was the passing game. And Tony Romo was almost flawless. He was 17 for 24. Uh, he was passing the ball around the field, but the running game was so dominant, that allows you to pass the ball. When you get ahead of the sticks, when you're looking at third and two and three and, and second and four, that now opens up your passing game. As a, as a coordinator, as a quarterback, you're able to do more things now, and, and the defense are on their heels because it's not third and nine, and they know you have to pass, or third and 15, and they know you have to pass. So, you know, the passing game worked so much, worked so well during Sunday's game because the running game and the offensive line, they protected, they gave holes for DeMarco, they gave a uh, uh, time for the routes to develop downfield, and they gave time for Tony Romo to throw the ball. And you know, head coach Jason Garrett had his press conference today, and he says, listen, run or pass, 
the success of our offense comes down to our offensive line. Are you thrilled to hear that? Does that make you happy? I know yes. it's true, right? Yeah, we, we sat here last week. We talked about how the offensive line really just, they just, they just got kind of beat up in the Kansas City they game. They sucked. <laughs> Come on, I'm, off, I'm, tr I'm trying to be Jesse nice Holly, about this, but Jess <laughs> Jesse is right. I mean, guys were missing blocks all over the place. It just, it wasn't happening. But you saw right from play one, there was holes. Guys were on guys. They were moving people off the ball. And it was great to see because St. Louis was supposedly you could pass the ball on them. You couldn't run the ball. They were letting up, I think, 2.6 yards of rushing. And all of a sudden, the Cowboys said, you know what, forget that. Bill Callahan, I really have respect for Bill Callahan because he took a lot of heat. He took the blame himself. And we know as players, a lot of that falls on the offensive line. But he said, you know what, it's my fault. I'm going to get it corrected. And he decided to go out there and run the ball down a good, I think, a good front four, a good set of linebackers. He ran it right down their throat. So hats off to Bill Callahan and the Cowboys. All right, so how about uh, Jim Proctor? What, kind of, what player stood out for you on offense? Well, on offense, it was uh, definitely DeMarco Murray. Uh, 24 rushes, 25 rushes, 175 yards, just dominant. And uh, didn't go down after first contact. Thought he got a lot of uh, lot of yards after contact, so I think he did a great job. Yeah, he's right. I mean, Demarco Murray, he's not he's one of those backs that is just not easy to take down, and he's an excellent receiver too. I mean, he's got great hands and he blocks the blitz. I mean, pass protection. They say he's one of the toughest running backs. You do not want to blitz the Dallas Cowboys with him in the backfield. One thing I noticed, you know, he was mentioning, you know maybe it was obvious what the play call was going to be for the Rams defense and they still couldn't stop the Dallas offense it was sweet it's unbelievable and let's talk about on the on the flip side of the ball the Dallas Cowboys defense Monty Kiffin's 4-3 scheme I mean what's this the eighth eighth game I yep. believe and it looks like the Cowboys have never played a 3-4 defense they've been playing this scheme all along you know Jesse what do you see out of this new uh, not new. I mean, it's an old concept, but new to the Cowboys. What have you seen out of this Monty Kiffin 4-3 scheme that you like so much? Well, talking to a, a bunch of the players in training camp and when the season started, one of the main things that they all said unanimously, player or plunk player, is that this defense has been simplified. Everybody knows their role. Everybody knows where, where they have to go. Everybody knows what it is that their job is on the football field. And, Mark, you know as, as former players – when you know what you're doing, you're able to play fast. And this defense is playing fast. These guys know their assignment. They know where they're supposed to go, and they're flying to the football. And Rob Marinelli, he has this, has this new culture about getting this ball out and, and creating turnovers. And these guys are flying to the ball, first man wrap up, second guy in there, ripping the ball out, punching the ball out, getting interceptions. I mean, they're creating turnovers all across the board. Now, we might not see another five turnover game again like they did in the first game of the season, but if you can go out there and get one or two turnovers a game, I mean, when you're plus two, you have an 85% chance to win a football game. And when you're plus three and more, it's almost 100% of the time you're going to win a football game. So those guys can go out there and continue to play fast, run around in that field, and, and, and give the, the offense great field position, I mean, that's just tremendous. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I think in the Kansas City game, weren't the Cowboys negative minus two in the turnover? I mean, yeah. you see what happens. I mean, that game, they, they, they should have won. But, you know, you lose the turnover battle. But I really like the turnovers so far this year for the Cowboys have been pretty good. But let's talk about uh, DeMarcus Ware. Unbelievable. I love him. I'm so impressed with him. And I have to say, I'm, I'm really impressed with any Cowboy that sets a new team franchise record. Him passing Harvey Martin for all-time career sacks leader for the Cowboys, I think is unbelievably impressive. 115. But I think when you look at the history of this franchise and the talented players that they've had here, to lead any category, I don't care what it is, passing attempts, rushing, yardage, anything, it, I think it really says something about the caliber of the player that you are. And I, I, DeMarcus Ware, I'm so happy to see him. We talked about this earlier. I don't ever want to see him drop back in coverage ever, ever, ever again. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see him maim and torment opposing quarterbacks. Oh, That's so where he it. belongs. And you can see him feeding off of that energy. You know, he talked after the game, I guess Jake Long had punched him in the head or punched him in the face. And he goes, 
that's the way the game goes. Literally the next play, he had a sack, his first one of the game. And he said, you have to show that you're going to respond to this. And he did. I, I love hearing stuff like that. It's super physical. It's exciting. And he is one of those dominant players. He is one of the players that the fans, they're wearing his jersey. So to see him be successful just makes it even more exciting for them. Yeah, it was great to see him. Congratulations to Marcus Ware. Um, I want to talk about the defensive backs. You know, Mo Claiborne's been beat up just a little bit. You know, Orlando Standrick comes into the game. He has the first sack of the season against the Rams. I mean, they, they've held, I mean, it was sackless for the whole entire season. Now, the Cowboys ended up having six sacks. Yeah. And DeMarcus Ware having two of those. But what have you seen from Orlando Scandrick? you know, coming off the edge like that in the blitz, in coverage? He's looked pretty good so far. Yeah, you know what? We, you had, we, we, we give a lot of grief to Orlando Scandrick all across the board. He gets a lot of heat. Uh, in, that, in that secondary, but he played well on Sunday. I mean, he's, he, he found a, comf a comfortable spot, and I thought coming into the game with him being faced up against uh, uh, but Austin, that that might have been a matchup problem. Fast, smaller guy in that slot, but Orlando played him well. The, the rush got to uh, uh, Bradford because the secondary coverage was covering these guys so well, but he's playing well. He's when that starting role that he got this past Sunday, he, he took it and he ran with it. Mo Claiborne is coming along. He's, he's a little beat up. I think his, one of his biggest issues this year with Mo Claiborne is that he didn't play all in preseason. And to, not, to be a young guy and not have any warm-up going into the season, these are now almost his warm-ups game. He's getting that little bit, the jitters out, the mistakes out. But Orlando came out Sunday. Uh, you know, we, we always hit the next man up. You know, the concept, next man up. When it's your time to go, be ready to go because it may not come again. And his time came up this Sunday, and he played really well. Well, I wanted to ask you guys, Jason Hatcher spoke to the team last week. It was a report on the NFL Network. My question is, is, you know, he talked to the team about being mediocre, and he wasn't going to take it anymore. I'm tired of this win one, lose one, win one, lose one. I don't want to do this anymore. And it looks like the team took it and responded, and I'm just curious as players – what is the difference between Jason Hatcher's message and the coach saying the exact same thing? Does it resonate more if a player says it? I think so. I mean, the coaches, you hear it all the time. The coaches are telling you, you need to do this, this, and this. When you hear it from a player, a guy you go to battle with, and Jason Hatcher is one of those guys that gives everything, every single play that he has. And he's really done well this year. And usually when, when you start to play really well and do what he's done, you become more vocal. The better, the better you are, the more you can kind of hold your head up and say, you know what, I'm going to take the lead. I'm going to take this team on my shoulders. And I think that's what we've seen from Jason Hatzer so far. Uh, one thing about, about football, it's a brotherhood. Those guys in that locker room with you, when you look across that, 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 that locker room, you see a guy looking back at you, and it's a brotherhood. And so when, when a guy like Hatz goes out and he speaks, he's not speaking to you as just a, another guy. See, a coach is a coach, but that when Hatz speaks – that's a brother speaking to you. That's someone who cares about you. That's someone who's in the trenches with you. That's someone who's doing the same thing that you're doing for the betterment of the team. So when he speaks, guys are going to listen to that. They, they take heed to that, and they say, you know what? He's right. That's my brother. What he's saying to us is that he's not saying anything selfish about we should play better because I want to get better stats. No, he's in the trenches with us. He's out there in this heat. He's in training camp with us. You know, he's in the meetings with us. He's on his buses with us, on a plane with us. This is my brother, and what he's saying is absolutely right, and that's why guys go out and respond, because it's a brotherhood, and when your brother speaks, you listen. All right, Dallas Cowboys, 2-1, and one, top of the NFC East. We look forward to a good game this week, hopefully against San Diego. That's it for this segment. We'll be back with more right here on the Drew Pearson Show. We'll be right back with more of the Drew Pearson Show right after this here at Henry's Tavern. All right, here we are back in the kitchen of Henry's Tavern with David. He's going to supervise me while I make a Philly cheesesteak. And why is this important to me, Jen? You know why? You're from Philly. I am from Philly. And a little known fact, I used to work in the kitchen, well, at a pizza restaurant, so I'd go back in the kitchen and make some cheesesteaks. So here's a return to my roots, and watch it. Because I might screw it up. So here we go. Let's put some oil on it. Let's see what happens. Here we are. So we got our meat. This looks like good cheesesteak meat. I toss it on there. And we have to chop it up. This is very, very important. All right. Mess it up. I won't mess it up. All right. If you're focused on the meat, I'm going to go ahead and drop the beer brain onions. 
to the Drew Pearson Show, and we're here at Henry's Tavern in Plano, Texas, and we love Henry's Tavern, and it's not just the over 100 beers on tap or the great food. There's free Cowboys tickets here, and what more could you possibly want? All you got to do is come here and talk to Rachel. That's me. And get a ticket, and you go in the raffle for free Cowboys tickets, and who wouldn't want to be at AT&T Stadium watching all the action live just as we do? Join us here at Henry's Tavern every week for your free Dallas Cowboys tickets. This is Paul Suffin for the Drew Pearson Show, and I'm here at Henry's Tavern in Plano, Texas, where we're checking out the 2014 Dodge Durango RT, which is all new for 2014. Let's check out the exterior. There's a brilliant black crystal pearl coat, 5.7 liter Hemi V8 with 8-speed automatic transmission, by xenon HID headlamps, LED tail lamps with red accents a power lift gate, 20 inch polished aluminum wheels. And let's check out that interior. There's the heated black leather seats with red stitching, heated second row fold and tumble captain chairs, leather wrapped heated steering wheel with audio controls and paddle shifters, the Uconnect 8.4 AN with touch screen navigation, backup camera, HD radio, and one year of free Sirius satellite radio. And here's one of my favorite new features is the rotary shifter. Now this is much better than the cumbersome regular shifter. And you could go from park to drive in no time flat. This is the 2014 Dodge Durango RT, which is all new for 2014. And you can get it at Dodge City of McKinney. Check out DodgeCityMcKinney.net. And we're back on the Drew Pearson Show. And this week's entertainment segment is an interview with the one and only Joseph Gordon-Levitt. I love him. He's such a great actor. He is. And as it turns out, he's a really good writer and director as well. He's written and directed his first feature film, which is called Don John, and it's in theaters this Friday. Now, our viewers probably know him from the Dark Knight trilogy, as well as 50-50 and... Third Rock from the Sun. That's right. That's where he got his start. Now, we're going to talk to him about the film, as well as what he's got coming up next, and a Hail Mary moment. Let's take a look. There's only a few things I really care about in life. My body, my pad, my ride, my family, my church, my boys, my girls, and my porn. My body, my pad, my ride, my family, my church, my boys, my girls, my porn. Body, pad, ride, family, church, boys, girls. That's her? That's definitely her. 
She's a dime. Oh, this girl's more than a dime, bro. Oh, my God. Were you in love with this girl already? Sure, I've seen this girl. Oh, my God. What's her name? What's her name? Why'd you say yes to me? I'm just gonna have to wait to find out. All right, I got time. You're cute. I like you. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Listen, you want to know the truth? You're the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. You like movies? I don't watch too many movies. The pretty woman, the pretty man, I mean, they drive off into the sunset. Everyone knows it's fake. I love movies like that, I yeah. know. It's great. But they watch it like it's real life. Oh. Baby. Yeah. What are you doing? I was just reading emails. No, you weren't. She caught me watching porn. That's it? Right? Oh! How do you watch that? How do you watch all the stupid movies that you watch? Movies and porno are different, John. They give awards for movies. They give awards for porn, too. So, there's only a few things I really care about in life. I don't know if I really want a wife and kids. Oh! You look what you did. I look like a grandmother. But do I have any grandchildren? If you want to lose yourself, you have to lose yourself in another person. It's a two-way thing. I thought you were different. And maybe it's time to try something new. Congratulations on this film. That's quite a feat to be able to write, direct, and star in a film. Thanks. But you've been in the business since you were a child. Is this something you've always dreamed of? Yeah, man. I love movies, and I love every part of movies. And, and you know, every facet of the filmmaking process is connected. So what you're doing with the camera, what you're doing with the editing, what you're doing with the music, these are all directly tied to your performance as an actor. And so um, I wasn't looking at it as all these disparate parts. I was just thinking, like, here's the story. Let's make a movie. So is it, I guess it's safe to say you'll want to do it again. I would love to do it again. I hope yeah. I get to. Yeah. Are you already thinking about the next one? Well, right now I'm working on this TV show called Hit Record on TV. This production company I started a long time ago called Hit Record uh, that anybody can contribute to. Um, we're, we're getting to do it on a really grand scale right now and make a TV show. So that's, yeah. that's where my, my head's at these days. Yeah, well, and I wanted to say congratulations on that because we spoke at South by Southwest several years ago. Yeah, yeah, it was that. just starting. Yeah, and, and now here it is. It's working! <laughs> so that's, that's great. Thanks. Well, now, also, I know that you've worked with a bunch of great directors. Did you call any of them up for this to kind of get a little bit of uh, advice? Yeah, definitely. That was, that was a huge... Uh, part of what made me feel like I could do it was um, getting feedback and talking to a lot of people that I'd worked with in the past. The first guy I ever showed my first draft of the script to was uh, Ryan Johnson, who's the writer-director of Looper and Brick, and a really, really good friend of mine. And then while I was finishing uh, the script, I was working on The Dark Knight Rises, and uh, I told Chris, uh, Christopher Nolan, that I was going to direct a movie, and, and uh, first of all, he was really encouraging. You know, he didn't he didn't say like, mm, "Are you sure you want to do that?" He was like, "Great, I think you'll be good at that." And and just that meant so much to me coming from him because Chris is not someone who will flatter you. He doesn't. He he's very very honest and to the point. It's one of my favorite things about it. And uh, and from that point on, he kind of would check in every now and then and say, "How's it going? Where are you at in the process?" You know, and and he would. He would point out little things that were little decisions he was making, oftentimes technical decisions that, that you don't think of as really important filmmaker things, but that are really important filmmaker things that you can only learn from having done it enough times. Yeah. And uh, he even came by our set once, actually, because um, we were shooting, we, we could afford one day, on the Warner Brothers back lot, and they were mixing Dark, Dark Knight Rises elsewhere. And he came by just to sort of, you know, lend us support and. He didn't have to do that. You know, he's a busy guy, and, and um, that meant a lot to me. And I think it goes to show why people like working for him so much and, and ultimately why his movies are so good, because he really he cares about the, the people that, that, that uh, work for him. 
Absolutely. Well, now this film has a great take on modern dating, and, and I know there's a complete skewered view for a lot of people, and do you think that's what it is, that people see a version of something on a screen and that's what they look for? I do think that, yeah. yeah I think uh, media is such a huge part of our culture and our lives, whether it's movies or TV shows or uh, magazines or the radio or pornography or any number of other things. Um, and I do think we have a tendency to see these stories, these sort of overly simplistic stories on screen and expect our lives to be the same way. But real life is not simple. Real life has all these little nuances and details that could never possibly fit into such a simple story. And, and that's a beautiful thing, you know? So, so Don John is a story about a, a, a guy and a, a gal who, um, who are both kind of missing it because they're so obsessed with these fantasies. Because, the, you know, uh, John, who I play, watches too much pornography. And Barbara, who Scarlett plays, she watches too many romantic Hollywood movies. And uh, they're, they're both missing what's real. Well, specifically, without getting too specific, you probably had some good inspiration yourself. And I know you've said before you don't consider yourself to be a celebrity, but still, it's got to be a little, little different for you. Sure, man. I, I, and I think that is part of, of where this movie came from, mm -hmm. is that um, you know, it's a movie about how people treat each other like things sometimes, more than like people. And actors are in our culture sort of treated in a weird way sometimes, like more like objects on a shelf than like humans. And here's the thing though, I, I don't think that it's only actors that experience this. I think everybody experiences this. I'm sure you've experienced it. You can tell when you're talking to someone, but they're not really listening. They sort of already think they know who you are. They've put you in a box and labeled it and they're not treating you like a person. They're not actually listening to what you have to say. They're they're, uh, they're treating you like a thing. And, and, uh, and so that's what this movie's about. The character I play at the, at the start of the show, he treats everything like a thing. Everybody, everything in his life. You know, definitely the women that, that he's with, the women that he watches on screen in these pornography videos, his friends, his family, his priest, even his own body, everything is sort of an object for his consumption. And by the end of the movie, hopefully you can tell he's, he's starting to break out of that mold. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the last question. The show is The Drew Pearson Show, and Drew famously caught the Hail Mary pass. And I think everyone has a Hail Mary moment in their life where they just had to go for something. They didn't think it was going to work out, but it did. What do you suppose that was for you? That's a good question. I mean, this could certainly be called one of those. Uh, writing a, a feature film is sort of like a Hail Mary pass, you're right, because at first, you're doing it alone. I guess some people work with partners and maybe that's different, but um, you know, there's a lot of time and, and effort spent where you've got these voices of doubt in your head saying, like, you don't need to do this, other people can do this better than you can, blah, 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 and you're tempted to stop. Um, and you know, I, just, I guess I found a way to enjoy it even for my own selfish reasons and just keep going because I had fun writing this script and when those voices of doubt would come up I would just say like well maybe it won't be good or maybe this won't work out but I'm having a good time writing it so what the hell why don't I just keep going with it and, um, and it worked out and I guess in that way it is sort of like a Hail Mary pass. Yeah well it certainly worked out for you congratulations on everything. Thanks Thank man you. Thank you. Wow, that looks great. It really is, and I think you're going to see a lot more from Joseph Gordon-Levitt as a writer and director. So the movie Don John is in theaters this Friday. Stay tuned for more of The Drew Pearson Show. Coming up next, the one and only Michael Nast. Welcome back to the Drew Pearson Show. We're live from Henry's Tavern in Plano, and I'm here with this, our social media director, Michael Nass, and he's been taking your questions via Twitter and Facebook all night, and I think he's going to try and stump me. What do you got for me, Michael? Well, usually this segment's 
called Just Ask Drew, but we changed it. It's Just Ask Mark tonight for this oh, special occasion. Oh, we're getting occasion. tricky here, yeah. All right. Uh, Becky Chernick on Twitter asks, in light of the uh, Romo Hatcher practice incident, did you ever get in Romo's face in a game or practice? It's a good question. I don't think that happened. I mean, let, let's be honest. I know Jason Hatcher. I know Tony Romo. These guys, Jason Hatcher would never do that. I'm sure he probably would call out any player just like he called out himself. And I don't think he did that to Tony Romo. I think it's one of those things that the media pretty much blew out of proportion. I heard Jason Garrett talk about it today on the fan. And I, it's just one of those things that, you know, we had, a, or we had, the Cowboys had a 31-7 to victory, and you had to find something to try to nitpick at. But I think Jason Hatcher probably is just holding the team accountable, and someone took that a little bit too far. Uh, Muller Entertainment asks, how did you recover from quote-unquote knee-ending knee surgery early in your career? That's a good question. I mean, early in my career, I had, you know, pretty severe knee injury. Um, in Chicago, it was a first-round draft pick, and seemingly it was, it, it was a Monday night football game in St. Louis. I had everything going pretty well, and my kneecap basically ex almost exploded, ended up behind my knee, floating around. Um, they, they, told me, they told me I'd never play again, but I just, you know, I kept at it. Two, two years of rehab, you know, after about a year, they said, you know, you should probably hang it up, but, you know, it took a guy like Coach Parcells here in Dallas to really take a chance on me, and he said, you know, listen, your first round draft pick, we're gonna get your, he your knee healthy. And I did that, I, I spent a year with our strength coach at the time, Joe Jurassic, and really worked our knee and worked as hard as I could and finally got a chance in 2006 to really get back into the game. And from there, the rest is history. But, you know, I owe it to Coach Parcells. I had a lot of resolve, you know, I, you know, I just didn't take no for an answer. Some people may have gave up, but I wasn't one of those guys. Well, since Waters came back, is there a chance for you? Brian Waters, you know, great player. Let me yeah. tell you, that guy's been around for a long time. I've been out a little bit longer than Brian Waters. So, no, I mean, I've lost 60 pounds. I'd have to really put on some weight. So I, I would say that is a negative. But I'll tell you, early on, you know, in preseason, all the talk about the offensive line, I was like, yeah, maybe I got a shot. But after seeing that game in St. Louis, the way they locked down that front four, I'm pretty happy with the offensive line is right now. All right, our final question comes from Joe Noagard on Twitter. What was your favorite moment as a Dallas Cowboy? My favorite moment as a Dallas Cowboy? Whew. That is a great question. I would say my favorite moment as a Dallas Cowboy, this is going to be pretty funny, but it, it was it, last week they played Kansas City. I thought one of my favorite games, I would say, was a Kansas City game that we played back in 2000, was it 2009? At Kansas City, Miles Austin's yeah. breakout game. That game was one of those games where it really had no business being in. You know, we had uh, Tashar Choice, a third string running back, in the game. Miles Austin, you know, at the time was an undrafted free agent out of Monmouth. And this guy just, it was unbelievable the way we came back in regulation and then ended up winning in overtime. I remember one of the happiest feelings I've ever had as a football player. So that would be one of my top, you know, games or favorite plays, favorite whatever. Sorry. Well, that's awesome. That wraps up our questions for Just Ask Mark this week. And remember to follow the Drew Pearson Show on Facebook, Twitter, and Google Plus, and follow Mark Colombo on Twitter. Yep, it's at Mark, Mark Colombo. At Mark go. Colombo. <laughs> Drew will be back next week, so thanks for watching, and join us next week right here on the Drew Pearson Show.